a lot of people think either you're hospitalized or you die or you're 100% fine, but there's this really distinct possibility of a lifelong, as far as we know at this point, disability that should really factor into people's risk calculations. I first got COVID-19 in July of 2020. I was very surprised to have my first symptom be that I could not taste the peppermint tea that I drink every morning. That's a very strong flavor. When I reached out to my healthcare facility to see what I should do, they said, you're young, you're healthy, you'll probably have this as your only symptom and be fine before you know it. I you know, progressed in the first week or so to have some pretty severe, in my um, view as someone with a past history of asthma, pretty severe trouble breathing. I was lucky enough to not have to be hospitalized, but it was a very scary experience to the point, you know, I was going to bed at night wondering if I was gonna be waking up in the morning. I had very severe shortness of breath in the first week, and then that slowly declined over the first six months. I had a really hard time with what a lot of people call brain fog, where you have trouble with critical thinking. It really took six months to get to the point where I felt like I had my brain working something close to the way it was before. It's changed and been sort of continuous since then where my main symptoms are really intense fatigue, which I had all of the time, but it's it changed after the first six months to a different level and daily headaches and also some chest pain that seems to be inflammation in different chest joints. Estimates range from 10 to 30% of individuals who get COVID-19 that have it. And there are estimated to be 17 million individuals in the US with long COVID and 72 million worldwide. The scale of individual symptoms varies widely. I would say I'm on the minor end. I'm able to keep working only because I can sit at a desk and sit still all day. If I had to be on my feet somewhere, I absolutely would not be able to. Many folks are even bed bound to, you know, the point they, their, their movement is just so restricted because their symptoms are so severe. There are many neurological symptoms where, you know, people just completely can't remember things. There's a lot of different types of chronic pain. There's a lot of inflammation. The scale and the scope of it is quite staggering. It was really sort of jarring as a patient to be going to physicians and having at least the good ones say, we really don't know how to treat this. We really don't know anything about it. It's brand new. And so from the very beginning, I was wondering how I could contribute to the research space, whether as a participant or you know, eventually leading some research. So what many individuals in the long COVID community has found is the only thing that helps them is something called pacing. So the idea is that you are being very careful how much mental, physical, and emotional exertion you have on a given day. And that if you can really control that and keep it within your limits, that you can avoid making your symptoms worse you know, some people get worse right away, but many, the, they don't feel the effects until a couple of days later. So for me, I was finding, I wasn't realizing that I was overdoing things until two days later when I would have the increase in symptoms. So we're doing a study about figuring out how we can teach people how to pace, essentially. So we'll be deploying just educational materials about how to pace to some participants, and then educational materials and a wearable device and, and materials about how to use the wearable device to pace to others. The idea is to say, okay, can we help you avoid relapses and potentially even have long-term improvement in symptoms based on being able to action this pacing advice that's surprisingly hard to implement on your own. My favorite feature for the wearable device that I have, which is a Garmin, is called Body Battery. What it does is take into account your sleep, your stress levels, um, your activity, and something called heart rate variability, all together in one score between zero and 100 that tells you how much energy you have left for that day. You know, I often find that I overexert myself, I don't feel the symptoms until two days later, 
And with the Garmin body battery feature, I'm able to see, okay, my body battery is going down. I need to slow down for the day and reduce my exertion. And that can help me avoid having those symptoms two days later. Well, we did the first large scale digital clinical trial in history. Five years ago, we recruited uh, many thousands of high-risk people for atrial fibrillation, a heart arrhythmia. And this was the first time it was all being done through websites and through a mobile app. Getting the consent and then sending them a wearable sensor that would, these people would have on their chest for 10 days or 12 days that recorded every heartbeat. And we were able to diagnose remotely with the participants never having to go see a doctor or go to a medical center or clinic, remotely were able to diagnose many people who didn't even know they were having atrial fibrillation, which is a risk factor for stroke. So that was the beginning of a whole new era in medical research for us and for others. And so we've adapted that to things like uh, maternal health, to sleep disorders, to diabetes, to personalized nutrition, and especially uh, in recent times to COVID. I'm really hopeful that this can basically provide scientific evidence behind what we've seen anecdotally in the community of many different people using wearables to help them with their symptom management. I'm hoping this can provide really rigorous evidence for that so that it can be you know, more broadly utilized and made aware to the physician community and the patient community so that it can be used more. This is perhaps the most exciting time in the history of medical research. In many ways, it's a reset. It's a complete rebooting of how we did medical research. The fact that we can tap into sensors that people are already wearing and collect data to determine whether that person has a possible a significant infection or a risk for some other sequela is extraordinary. And so we hope uh, to continue to lead in this space and stimulate, inspire others to follow because we think this is such a, a rich and exciting opportunity of how we can learn about ourselves and keep people healthy.